Just take a look at the canal. We're going to be talking about drip irrigation. And in this talk, we're also going to do a little demonstration up on the stage. And I have some volunteers who are going to come up and put together the major parts, plus a little of the other, just so you can get an idea how when you plan, it goes pretty smoothly. I want you to notice that we have the Clackamas County Master Gardener uh, website on there. And you can look at more handouts and videos at that site. OK, where did it all start? How long ago do you think man started irrigating crops? 4,500 BC. And what they used for irrigation were clay pots, unglazed, put in the ground, filled with water, and it seeped through the terracotta to deliver water to the plants. Those were buried, so it delivered the water where? To the roots. Very good. Oh, you are so awake and alert. That is wonderful. Pros and cons of some different irrigation methods. We'll flip through those pretty quickly. Some advantages and disadvantages of a drip irrigation. I have found a few of them. Um, planning. What you need to consider before you get started. And then what makes up a typical drip system. And putting, this is the demo, putting together a simple drip system before your very eyes. This was known as the Fertile Crescent. And you can see many nations are now in this old area. This is where agriculture started. This is where they found those clay pots for watering. Pretty neat. This is an older style. This is a windmill that used to be pulled, used for pumping water out of the ground to irrigate. Typically, the irrigation then was flooding. Isn't that a wonderful head of water? Looks beautiful. There are some problems with flooding. Um, but I want you to see here is that's a big head of water, such a big head of water that they lay down plastic like you would put in a pond to keep it from digging a huge hole. And the best thing about flooding, particularly if you do it in a yard, is that the kids can go out and play in the water. <laughs> that's what I grew up with. Just beyond where the black plastic is laid, you'll see there's a little slope on the side of the, there's a fence, and then there's kind of a little slope. That's how close the canal is for this particular individual. The water coverage is good, but mm, it uses a whole lot more uh, water spread out where it evaporates faster. So there's a lot of water that goes to waste. Um, and watering weeds means what? Weeding. Weeding. Weeding is time consuming. It's costly. And you'll notice that most of these pictures I have of different types of watering happen to be um, commercial. So this is overhead sprinklers. <coughs> Can anybody tell? I mean, they're up here. So do you recognize that some of these are really bad? Um, they don't operate very well in wind. So if you live in a windy place, you might as well forget these, because it's not going to go where you want it. Um, they can also limit access, as can flooding, because any of your access points, whether they're paths or between um, rows, is going to be wet and muddy. And it's going to be that way probably for a couple of days. It also waters the foliage, which can create an environment where disease can really take hold. And I don't have a picture of O'Hare Sprinkler, but I think most of you can visualize. <laughs> right? Yeah. So a lot of farmers are now changing over to drip systems. So in the first slide here, what you see in the front is a check stand, or that's what I used to call it, was a check stand. It usually has three or four little holes that go out the side that have little gates. And you can direct the water by opening a gate or closing a gate. And they've used that to run their main lines. So the main lines are protected, and they're underground. Also UV protection that way. And these are the lines that are dropped down and delivering water in between the grapevines. On the right, that is a grove of pistachio trees that um, from the very beginning was watered with inline emitter drip system. The soil is clay. This is just the beginning of a cycle of watering. These are run twice a week for 24 hours. 
It's quite a lot of water going out to them. But trees take a lot of water. Um, and the only problem with this is, you notice it looks very nice and clean. This is a ranch that belongs to a friend of mine. He took the pictures for me of some of these that are down in California. And I was out there, I arrived just in time that he was coming in off the tractor. He didn't look particularly happy. He saw me, he started laughing, he said, boy, you know those tractor blades can make hay out of the drip system really <laughs> fast. That was in the first few months that they had their trees planted. So you do have to be careful with drip systems that are laid on the ground. Drip irrigation, look at the advantage, 90% efficient water use. With the idea that we're needing to be able to have more water for things than flooding a field, that's very important. It does water the plant roots, just like those old clay pots. You have less disease, fewer weeds. You don't have to spend a lot of time putting chemicals on to kill your weeds. If you're an organic grower, you, you're doing much better. The air and water balance in the soil is pretty well maintained. Okay, what are the bads? Trip hazard. How many of you have tripped over a hose before? <laughs> oh yeah. Pins are really helpful for that. And you can put them every two to three feet, closer if you're going around a curve. Shovels. And my instinct is, if the shovel doesn't go in, you push harder. Anybody do that? <laughs> oh my gosh. And you wouldn't think that a trowel would do that, but if you push hard enough, it will too. Rakes. Rakes are particularly hung up in the quarter inch line, which I call spaghetti lines, okay? Um, you have to make sure you're draining or have an emitter or an opening at the lowest spot of your line so you can drain it for the winter. And your major equipment or major parts need to be taken in in the winter. We bring ours in, we dry them out in the house for a few days and then they get uh, put away. It does require regular maintenance, but quite frankly, even flooding a field does because you're doing check valves and you always have to make sure that the water hasn't pushed through a check valve or the gopher hasn't undermined it. Planning your drip system. This is something you really need to consider very seriously. What kind of soil type do you have? You'll notice that the sand, the water goes almost straight down. So if you are planting a tree in sandy soil, what are you gonna have to do? Water more often, maybe more emitters. You may want to use a variable emitter. Sometimes those go from like zero to 35 gallons an hour. And if it's a tree you're expecting to grow and provide you with fruit, that might be your best alternative. Sometimes you might want to loop the line in a circle about the size of the root reach on it, the root zone. In the sandy loom, that's the ideal stuff. How many of us have ideal? <laughs> but that would be the ideal. My mother has soil that's just to the right of the sand. Um, very, very sandy soil. In fact, I've heard it called sugar sand because you take a shovel full out and a shovel full falls back in. Clay. Clay is really good because it also retains water quite well. But you have to know that you've got clay because if you open the, the emitters, the same as you would for the sand, you will have water running everywhere. It'll be almost as good as flooding. Okay. So that's one of the first things. The other thing you need to know is about how much does it take. And I want you to notice down here, the last one is established trees, 10 gallons per inch of trunk. And we saw those pistachio trees. The diameter on those is probably three to four inches. So you take three to four inches and that's gonna be like 40 gallons of water per hour to deliver enough water. And it probably has to be done more than once a week. My friends, he waters twice a week for 24 hours. Perennials, about two gallons. The other way, the general rule that we tend to give to everyone is one inch of water a week for a 10 by 10 space. And you see what that comes out to be? So when you plant your vegetable garden, plant it close to a water source because you don't want to be carrying water every week. That, that's like a full-time job. <laughs> Determine your flow rate. 
Uh, there's also a good video out there on the site that um, Sherry Shung did, and it's on putting in a um, drip system for a small area. And if you've not put in a drip system before, doing something small like containers, getting a kit, uh, or a small bed is a good place to start. I look at some of the lines that I laid originally, and that was even after having a couple of kits to work with, and I thought, what amateur put this together? <laughs> Most of those have now been replaced. So basically, you get a bucket. Most of the ones that I see are five gallon, but you can get smaller. Just make sure you know how many gallons. And you're going to fill that bucket from your faucet, hose bib, um, whatever you want to call the little bugger out there you're going to use as your source. And record the number of seconds that it takes to fill that bucket. That's going to give you a rate of flow. And then from that, you calculate the gallons of flow per hour. And the gallons in the bucket divided by the seconds to fill it multiplied by the number of seconds in the hour will give you your flow in gallons per hour. Okay? And if you don't want to do that, you say, okay, I have a maximum of 75% I can use, and you're going to be using the trial and error method. You need to add up all the emitters, how they're open and how much they are pushing out. If you have 200 feet line laid out for your main line, you cannot have more than 200 gallons going out an hour. Does that make any sense to you? That's the maximum. That's the rule I keep in my head when my husband and I are snaking lines through a flower bed. And I try to make sure we don't go to the 200 limit. Okay, so you want to make sure that you stay within the limits. And most manufacturers put out a really good um, brochure. You can usually get them online. And they may be pages and pages of really dull, boring reading. Take it to bed. It will put you to sleep. But it does have good information. And usually they have some really pretty good drawings and things in them. Another one is draw a plan. What we had is four 8 by 8 beds in our kitchen garden. These are poured in concrete. They're squares with a little end cut off. And so we wanted, I wanted, I've got pots that I sit around the corners, so you might as well be honest about this, and I wanted to be able to water them separately because the beds themselves get watered for 15 to 30 minutes. Pots don't usually need that much. They need a little spread to them, but they don't need that much water. So we were looking at what can we do, how do we do a layout, where's our source of water coming from, and neither of these designs were the ones that we finally went with. But this was just a scrap of paper that something had come in the mail. It was an invitation for something. And I said, OK, I can draw little one-inch squares for our garden. So a rough sketch is pretty good. We're going to talk about the major components that go into a drip system. So here we have a Y valve. And you'll notice that the timer is hooked to only one. Why do you think that might be? So you can use the hose. And as soon as you put the whole system on a single spigot and have no other ability to hook any hose to it, you'll want that hose. <laughs> there's washing off the mower. There's filling a bucket with water because you're going to transplant and you're soaking it in the water. OK, so that's real handy to have. I don't use it very often, but it is handy. Then we have the timer. If you have even a small yard, it is very handy to have an automated watering system that goes on and off. You want to make sure that you're not doing it in the middle of the night, but you want to do things like this so they're watering in the cool of the morning. Drip system is not going to evaporate nearly as much as some of the other things that we looked at because it's contained till it reaches the roots. We have a brass back float. See the brass? It's really not very big. And that's to prevent the water from going from your hose and getting drawn back in to whatever water system you have, whether it's a well or whether it's a municipal system. Always check with the, um, the county or municipality to make sure what you need to do when you put this type of system in. So then we have a pressure regulator, which for the world to me looks like a female end for a hose. And then we have a Y filter. The Y filter, you'll notice it's pretty good size, but it kind of hangs off to the side. 
What that does, it comes apart and it allows you to clean out the filter, not while the water's running, but without taking the whole system apart. So you don't have to worry about having a lot of things get plugged along the way. Is there a need for a filter on city water? On city water, not typically. Um, there again, you know, it's filled, it, they already did the filtering for us, so it's not as important if you're on a municipal uh, water system. But there are a lot of water systems that are not. So uh, any well, my mother's, I never even fiddled with, but all of a sudden the tank got holes in it and we had to replace the storage tank. So well, the storage tank, and the real story is that it took four men to lift the thing off of its concrete pad because it was half full of sand. <laughs> yeah. Um, and if she had a filter of any nature for the well, I do not know where it was. I had to clean out her shower about every six weeks or it wouldn't flow at all through the shower. Okay, this is just a variety of pruning clippers. I also use them when they're sharpened to cut my lines, both the short, the quarter inch, and I tend to use five eighths of an inch. The bigger, pro the bigger your property is, the larger diameter you're gonna want on a water line. And I did try a kit when I wanted some containers done and they only provided the quarter inch line. And the quarter inch line was inadequate for going 30 feet by 30 feet and watering the pots. I went to a bigger line. I think at that point it was only half inch. It was whatever I could get handily. And the thing to remember is whatever you start off with, unless you're gonna replace everything, always stick with the same size. It will make life a lot easier. As I said, we had half inch, now we have five eighths. And the fittings for the half inch are horribly difficult to get your five eighths inch tubing into. <laughs> so, you learn, you know, that's what we're here for. If we didn't learn something every day. The one thing that I did learn is that I don't have enough grip ability and the gloves with the, the um, rubber sort of grippy palm are really good for putting systems together. The other bit of advice I would provide is that you need a place to store your pieces and you need to have it labeled and at the beginning of this year and you're cleaning things up, put them back in that order. At the end of cleaning things up, put it back in that order, you'll be ready for the next year. So hand clippers are really good for cutting the tubing. And the other three items here are really for doing repairs. Sometimes you're really in a hurry, you're gonna clip off a barb or you're going to clip off an emitter and put it aside for the winter to clean it up so you can reuse those little parts. They are not cheap. Um, they're cheaper than what I was doing before. But anyway, so pliers is to get the hose crimped so that you can get the other pliers on. And the scissors there are really pointy, really pointy. You've got to be really careful. Do not put them in your pocket. <laughs> they are really good on the quarter inch line, cutting it off of barbs and things. And the ankle pliers, that's for getting things bent over. These punches are in the back. You can try them out. I have my preference. I will not, I will not paint your decision. There are more than this. Supplies, you're gonna need hoses. The one on the right with the blue striping on it, that is one that has emitters embedded in it every six inches. The one on the left is just quarter inch tubing. The one in the front is five eighths. A variety of pins. I tend to use hangers and I bend them over, and those are my pins. And that way I can afford to use a whole bunch of pins. If you're doing a curve, you see how curved that larger piping is? To get that to stay like that in the ground, you will have to put pins in probably about every six to eight inches around the curve. The emitters in the line are really good for row crops and vegetable gardens. More supplies on the left, some barbs, they call them goof plugs, I just call them plugs because you can actually use those plugs to end a quarter inch line and they don't blow out. It's very good. I mean, you're talking low pressure here. We're not talking high pressure. And that's another tip. You do not want to take high volume sprinklers and try to put drip on the same system. Not going to work. And I've, I've always wondered how come some of the tops at my mother's house are blowing off? Well, number one, they were variable and I had them open pretty far. That doesn't help. But, <laughs> but if you have that pressure regulator, that's gonna help a lot too. 
Okay, so this is just a variety. You can see more of that in the back. Here, the only thing that might be a little strange is there's a riser. That's the one, the really long one there. And that one you can actually cut up, but the mill thickness on the wall of that tubing, you can thread little emitters into. They have special emitters with threading on them, and those won't go anywhere. Um, I just saw the pressure compensating drip emitter on the stake on the far right bottom. Looks neat, but one of the ways you can tell whether you're, whether you're getting one that already has a compensator in it, the green one up there, you see how fat it is compared to the red. The red is just a sort of little, little disc. The fatter one is pressure compensating. Automatic timer, battery operated in this case, the chamber is off to the right instead of running through the middle of the mechanical area. We've not had this one fail. And it provides really consistent watering. The backflow, we already talked about what that was for, and this is just a close-up view. Pressure regulator. Important, particularly if you are using the water system and um, you want to put that down, make sure you don't turn your faucet on full or it'll overwhelm the pressure regulator. Okay, this is our filter. That's the finished system. And now we're going to have some volunteers come up on stage and we're going to put together a system. If you plan, it goes quickly. Have you ever tried putting you can. I don't do that because I'm not usually watering plants that take the same fertilizer. Um, if you're doing a garden row and everything's the same, you're fine. Okay, I just need people to stand and we're going to start. Okay, and you may need to hold things for your neighbor. So if you would start with the, um, he's got the Y and he's got the timer. And some of these are a little tricky because you're trying to hold them. Well, but this is like it would be in the garden. So he's going to get that on. And the next thing to go on is a what? Back flow. If you already have one, that's fine. Yeah, if you don't, just add one. They're small. They're not particularly expensive. They're easy to put on. Yeah. Okay, and screw on the pressure regulator next. The next one's the filter. It's big. It's a little clumsy. So two people putting this together is better. I had to hold the thing and cradle everything. <laughs> and trying to get it going was kind of strange. Okay, and then we have the hose line. So this is going to be our hose going out to actually water. just so it won't fall off. Oh, oh, all right. And then on the end here, can you crimp the end for us? And this is one form of an end that you can purchase. You can also use black electrician's tape and go <laughs> This is easier because when you go to clear the line or flush the line or crut, you can just snip it off, you know, pull it off, open it up, and the dirt comes flying out. At my mother's house, it comes flying out. Okay, and if you would go ahead, that's the hole punch. Make sure you get it in good into the little channel. Go right ahead. Okay. Now, can you punch in the little? I put the emitter already on the other end. Did you hear that pop? You hear that? That's the pop. If it's really warm weather and you've got this out, because that's the best time to put in a water system of this nature, because then everything is warm and it's easier to get things into. Now, the other thing is, if it's cold weather, you want to hold that up like it might look in the garden, attached to the up water. Yeah, yeah, there we go. So, you see how quick and simple that was? It's quick and simple because it was planned out. 